This is Christine Fonner, and you are about to listen to a recording of a Routines and Rituals free workshop. We do occasionally offer free workshops to be able to bring community together, share in resources, and learn new strategies. Enjoy! State really briefly. Um, so I have been working in this space for about two years now. Um, my PhD work is almost done. My research will be starting. So if you are a woman in leadership and you have experienced toxic leadership, let me know and I will put you on my list for reaching out to you to be part of my research study, which is a good and a bad thing, right? Like I love that I can have so many women interested in being part of my study, but it's also really depressing because there are so many women with <laughs> like traumatizing stories of how they've been treated in the workplace. So let's talk about routines and rituals and why they're really important. And I know a lot of you have kind of heard the spiel maybe a little bit, but really um, the whole purpose here of looking at the workshop today is to determine and identify the difference between a routine and a ritual and what how they each are really important in your daily life, but also why they're each very important in your daily life and the differences of them. So routines are really important because they provide safety, security, predictability, efficiency, comfort, and healthy habits. They can also limit us, right? And so this is something that I like to really have you reflect on. Like my routine got all messed up this morning. Tina, <laughs> yours did too. And it's it dysregulates us. And it, and it goes all the way back to your seven-year-old self. So by the time between the ages of three and five is when you learn what safety and security is in your environment. And you start creating spaces for yourself between the ages of three and five, sorry, three and seven, where you can find safety, security, comfort, and predictability. That's really important for us because as human beings, we have not evolved enough to not constantly look for threat, right? So we as human beings are just really always looking for things that don't match or are not predictable in our environment. And we're constantly asking, is that safe or is that not safe? And for children that had trauma in their childhood, right? we are looking for them much more acutely. And as adults, we've learned how to kind of regulate, we've learned how to identify whether somebody is in fact a threat or not. But we, we tend to go into these physiological responses when we're dysregulated and routines help us regulate. And so that's number one reason why they're so important. Um, when you're feeling like there's so many dishes in the sink and you're like, oh my God, there's so many dishes in the sink. It's so frustrating to me. This is my husband. He's like, so frustrating to me. It dysregulates him because it's something that provides him with this sense of orderliness and cleanliness and being able to have resources at your fingertips ready to go. That's from his childhood, right? And so for me to put dishes in the sink is like a trigger for him. Like, oh my God, now my, my environment's messy, it's dirty, it's unpredictable, and it's not ready for what I need. That's, an, that's why we have these routines in our lives. So, you know, our partners and people we live with also have these regulations and dysregulations. So like for me, putting dishes in the sink isn't a big deal. I'll get to it later. But I know it dysregulates my husband because that routine is so important to him that that sink stays empty right? So these are the things like our routines and rituals really are impacted by other people as well. So I always like to give the example of my morning routine it has to do with cleaning because for me, I like to have a really nice clean space so I can think. And, and I can't think when there's lots of noise or there's lots of messiness. And a lot of my work is creative work where I need to write or I need to speak well or I need to be able to think about what my client needs or I need to be able to put a book together, whatever it is. And if I can't get into that clean space in my world, it's really hard for me to get into that clean space for my brain to have space to think. So my morning routine, I get up, I take the dogs out. I start my coffee, I start a load of laundry, I brush my teeth, right? So I have this routine that's very predictable when I'm home, <laughs> right? And it creates this real stability for me. And it, it helps me also mentally prepare for my day. And I give space in that routine to look at my calendar and I don't look at it right away because that brings anxiety to me. And so think about your routine, like what is bringing anxiety and what is actually helping you prepare and get into your day, right? Thoughts on this so far? 
Yeah, I, I would like to be more consistent with that. It's just like, I don't know. I, I've always been a very routine person, and I've tried to follow it, but it's like, I don't know, as I've gotten older, it's actually gotten, and well, I'm having kids and stuff has played a huge part in it, but it just, like, I, I shouldn't say I can't do it, but I really, really struggle to do it. Yeah. Well, and to be clear, right, your routine is not your child's routine. It's not your husband's routine. That's why I was kind of explaining, like, my husband's routine is different than mine, and it can sometimes really conflict, right? So this is oh, your yeah. routine. And, and and you know, what do, like, and we talked about this before, Aaron. like, what do we have to do to get our routine on the table? Yeah, my, since my kids have grown and I have gotten used to my own routine, now that my grandkids are throwing their stuff in there, my routine has gotten kind of discombobulated <laughs> again. What and it, it is, it just makes you a mess. <laughs> when when working, that keeps me on, you know, a, a work routine and you have to add in your, your child's routine. You really do because they have a routine too. And if they're not driving, you're part of their success in getting them where they need to be. So there's a constant, like, I think that was your aunt that was speaking. There's a constant, I guess, yo-yo effect being pulled different directions on what my needs are versus what his are. And mm -hmm. he can't be full unless I get him where he needs to be. But yet my day is completely ruled by his needs over mine in the end. <laughs> it's hard. It really yeah. is to find your own space or your own rhythm again that works for you but it is necessary when, when we as women tend to self-sacrifice first for the greater good right like well who's gonna do it I guess I'm gonna have to do it right like what am I gonna <laughs> give up what is the thing in your morning that you tend to give up mine is shower like I will push until the very end and go oh, I don't have time for a shower because then I have to get ready and blah, blah, blah. And so I, I did a rinse off this morning, which is how I got dysregulated. I didn't want to do a rinse off. I'm going out into an airplane and I'm already off my routine and now my hair is dirty. So <laughs> I, I think for me, just that peace and solitude, um, and I'm, and I'm not going to say meditation, but almost like a meditative state where you have that time for prayer or that cup of coffee or that hot tea, that me time, because once the alarm goes off, it's boots on the ground. And it's, it's a, uh, for me in my world, it's like, Cohen, don't forget, we have to leave by 630. You have to be at school by 705. And that's on a late day. On the early days with football practice, we have to leave here at what time? At 530, because he has to be there dressed and ready by six. So I think it's the constant change in the routine, which makes me put myself last. I agree that it's the change in routine. I think the constant, um, yeah. that it's different, that mm -hmm. it's not, you know, one day it's this thing and the next day it's this thing. Right. Right. It could be something else. Yeah. Right. Well, and the thing, the thing that I like to point out here is it doesn't have to like, and this is where, this is where I like to teach routines and rituals because this is how we can teach regulation and like when things aren't the same, how do we keep the regulation? How do we keep the stability? How do we keep the security? How do we not go into like, oh, hold on again, Sorry. again, right? <laughs> like, so the question on this one, and the, this is where I want you guys to reflect and take maybe a minute to just jot something down. What are three things that really regulate you? I like three things that really help me in my routine are uh, taking a walk or having some outside time, even if that means just opening a window for five minutes. Um, another one. That's is, my morning stuff right there. <laughs> the other one for me in the afternoon is like, I tend to hit like a 3 PM slump where like, I either want to lay down or I, I yawn nonstop. I had a meeting on Monday where I literally yawned like 15 times and it was so <laughs> embarrassing. Cause like, right, you're like in this project, it's supposed to be exciting. And I'm just like yawning through somebody talking and I felt so bad, but maybe what would have helped is just drinking a cup of water before I went into that meeting. You know what I mean? So like, think like routines can be really task driven or they can be really like, consistency driven so it kind of depends but I would just take a few minutes and just write yours down it's when there's a book by Daniel H. Pink called when 
And he talks about the science of our circadian rhythms. He talks about our energy levels throughout the day. He talks about night owls versus, you know, uh, uh, morning people. Like my mother is like this crazy morning person and it's like the worst. Um, and my dad and I are not, right? And we're like, we, we think it's the worst. And then, then you also have introverted versus extroverted, right? And I purport myself as an introverted extrovert, which means I can pretend really well to be an extrovert but it, it depletes my energy. And, and when I'm done, I need to go and recover, recuperate and re-energize in a really quiet, introverted, away from people way. We my are husband a lot like that. is the opposite. Like, I like right? that way. Yes. Yeah, so my <laughs> husband's the opposite of that. He goes into a social setting and it's just like jazzes him up. He's just energizing. <laughs> He's, he is charging his battery up and and it, yeah. it leaves it's more exciting mine i'm working hard at this <laughs> <laughs> so so when you think about this there are kind of like four things that that daniel h pink talks about and if you're on linkedin or um or tiktok daniel pink has some great stuff on there like little videos and little sayings and stuff he he shares a lot of really great information um but one of the things that he, you know, he, so he identifies that you have people who are night owls and you have people who are morning birds and you have people that are introverts and you have people that are extroverts and you have people that are kind of like in between and our energy levels fluctuate depending on the activity, depending on yourself and how you're doing, right? And on, on what time of day it is for you. And so one of the things that I like to, to talk about is like, what, and, and some of us don't get to be super flexible, right? Like if I have to come in at work, like this morning, I had an 8 a.m. client call. Typically, I do not schedule anything before nine o'clock in the morning because I know I am not a morning person. I am super low energy, super introvert until about nine o'clock in the morning. But occasionally, because we're all human beings in the world of interacting with each other, we make exceptions or we get up early for our son, whatever it is, right? So this morning I got up early. I didn't get up early, but I I, I, sh I shortened my routine and my rituals to be able to have this client meeting. And then it got moved. <laughs> like, <laughs> but this talks about that, right? Like I know for myself and I'm lucky because, you know, when I was a teacher, I had to be in my classroom by 6.45, 7 a.m. if I wanted to be ready for my kids coming in at 7.45, Right. And so even though I'm not a morning person, I would rather have that seven to seven forty five or six forty five to seven forty five time to myself to get prepared for my day, knowing I'm going to have like 30 kids coming in screaming. Right. So so, you know, this is where you can start thinking about how do I adjust to my real world, but also give myself what I need. And I try like when I was a teacher, I did have my own locus of control. Right. So my students knew from 7.45 in the morning until nine, we did quiet things. We had quiet centers, we did quiet work, we had quiet <laughs> groups, everything was quiet until nine. And then we could party down, right? But those are the things that I had control over. And so that's something to think about in this space. When I'm talking about your routines, I'm not talking about rituals right now. I'm talking about routines and tasks and things that have to get done. Where are the places that you have some flexibility to be able to do them when you want, or can you adjust what, when and how, right? And that's what I love about his book. It's time for writing. Like I love writing and I'm right now I'm writing a lot for my PhD and, you know, I have to do about 30 hours of work for my PhD a week right now. And I know that like 8 a.m. to about 10 is the best time for me to be able to do that because my routines and ritual my morning ritual piece, like I love having a cup of coffee, checking in with friends, you know, like doing some things that like bring joy to me, read a book, go out for a walk with the dogs. My rituals are very flexible um, and just depends on how I feel, but I like to do that in the morning. So between eight and 10 is when like my brain is firing and I want to write, right? It doesn't mean I get to do it every day, but that's when I try to schedule it the most. I mean, I think I'm, I fall into that lark piece. Um, but what's interesting is like, I, I'm more productive in the morning, but only for things that like for work, if you were to put me to go to the gym in the morning, 
I can't do it. Like it's just, it is certain things. Um, I do better wow. doing the gym at the end of the day. Versus yeah. And that's really important to recognize, right? It's, and, and that's the, and that's why I like when he talks about when and what in his book, <laughs> that you are good with task driven things. You've got to get done in the morning. Cause your brain is probably creatively firing a little bit better, like problem solving a little bit more resilient. You're not burned out from all the problems and fires of the day. You have the strategic brain that's fresh, right? So you're able to really get some stuff done, but if you put that into a physical form, forget it. Right. For me, I like to get everything done in the morning and I will make sure that everything that I can do, I will do in the morning. And then I can always have my afternoon or evening, you know, to myself to be a, well, until my husband gets home and then it's not so much, but, <laughs> yeah. but at least the afternoon I can do whatever I want. If I want to take my old lady nap, I can. And if I want to go out and work in my garden, I can, you know, it's, yeah. When Daniel talks too about the creative flexibility of when and being able to not have everything scheduled out. And that's kind of, we'll talk about that when we get to rituals that like routines, we, we do schedule out as much as we can because it creates that consistency, but to really like find joy in your world, you need to have flexibility of choice and to say right now, I feel like doing maybe nothing, maybe gardening, maybe the, but having that flexibility. And that's why I was saying back here, you know, routines can get really limiting because if, if they take up all of our day and we're doing all the things we have to do, then we're not getting to the joy spaces of choice. And choice is where joy in ritual comes from. I choose to go to a birthday party, which is a very big ritual. I choose to go garden because it brings me peace. It brings me happiness. It connects me to the earth, right? Like that, so that we're getting there, but that's kind of what we're talking about here is that our routines, if, if, if we don't have that balance of, of routine and ritual and we're all routine, we're all have to, we don't have that space of choice and love and care and joy, we start feeling very limited, trapped. Yeah. But if we know this, and this is, you know, this is talking a little bit about emotional balance that we, 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 and I'm spending a lot of time in this in my PhD right now, talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and looking at our basic needs versus what brings us fulfillment and joy and love. And really what it boils down to is our emotional resilience. You know, how resilient we are throughout the day really determines how much we feel like we have to do versus what we, we get to do, Right. And so our emotional resilience actually changes throughout the day. And the way that we handle conflict also changes throughout the day based on our emotional balance from the morning to the end. So if you look, you know, getting up in the morning and having a fight with your husband is probably not the best bet because none of you, neither of you are feeling emotionally balanced. You're trying to find your regulation for the day. Routines are very important in the morning. Rituals are very important in the morning to find your balance for the day, right? Lunch dates are always super fun because, you know, we, we get excited to take a break from work. We get excited to take a break from the have tos. Maybe I'm going to go for a walk. Maybe I'll meet a friend. Great time to do that. It's very rewarding, right? Then we get that slump where we all want to take a nap and half of us can't and half of us can so this is something to think about when you want to have tough conversations, when you want to, um, when you want to resolve problems, you have to really pay attention to when are you most resilient. Here's something that I wanted to kind of leave. If you are having a hard time right now with establishing a good routine, and it doesn't have to be every day, but knowing what your routine is that brings you fulfillment, safety, security, consistency, and regulation is really important. Even if you can't have it every day, knowing that that's what would do it for you at the highest potential, at least allows you to kind of adjust and, and meet it to the best of your ability whenever you can. So establishing effective routines, what brings us joy as human beings in routine is not wasting our time, right? understanding when is the best time, when am I emotionally resilient, when am I most active, when am I most creative, when do I need a break, when do I need rest. The art of flow, which I'll talk about here in a minute, 
start of flow is when we're really good at something and it brings us a lot of joy. We forget we're doing it. Time flies. Like some people, it may be knitting. For me, it's mountain biking. Um, you know, it's just something that you do really well that is so fun when you're doing it and you have a high level of expertise in doing it that the time flies and you're just feeling like one with it, right? It's like a, it's feeling one with your art. Right? Tasks are things I have to get done. I have to take my son to school. I have to do the dishes. I have to make sure the dogs go out so they don't pee on the floor. Tasks are things that I really need to accomplish to be able to live like, you know, a productive human being, <laughs> right? Goals are things that I might aspire to and the way that I want to live. What kind of person do I want to be? What kind of life do I want to live? What kind of uh, day do I want to have? These are things that like, that help me grow as a human being and help me feel like I'm doing something for the greater good. So this is a quote from Daniel Pink I love using, and I actually use it in almost all of my corporate trainings that I do. I almost, I use it almost every in every single one. Because as leaders, we have to remember this tremendously. When we, when we have people that work for us, we have to know and remember that people need to be autonomous and be able to make decisions for themselves in their expertise, but that they also really need time and space for connection both through the work and through relationship. So I want to talk about rituals because rituals are why we feel joy in the world. Rituals are where we celebrate. Rituals are where we appreciate. It's where we acknowledge like the amazingness of being alive on a spinning planet in the middle of the universe, right? It's where we realize living and life is like a miracle in and of itself. And so we celebrate those things. And sometimes it's as simple as like giving yourself 10 minutes to have a cup of coffee with nobody else, right? Sometimes it's celebrating a, a first birthday of a child, right? It's, it's a wedding ceremony. It's going to church and remembering that you have this really sacred relationship with your higher being, right? It's These are rituals. And, and we, we love ceremony around ritual because as humans, we're so connected to routines and we're so connected to making sure we're safe and secure that ceremony, oopsie, I would do that all the time, I talk with my hands. Um, ceremony gives us the opportunity to have a routine or a ritual, right? Or have a routine in the ritual. <laughs> like we know what to expect. And that's why I think rituals are so fascinating because ceremonial rituals are very structured, right? We have, we have birthday cake, we have candles, we sing a song. Routines are so critical that we even do them in our rituals and in our ceremony. And it's to give us that sense of security in the midst of joy and in the midst of the unknown, in the midst of going, oh my God, I can't believe I'm still alive. This is amazing, right? So when we're in our daily lives, we tend to throw rituals out the door and we make them all tasks. We make them all routine. Oh, I got to make the coffee. Oh, I got to get a cup in me before I hit the room because I'm not awake yet. Like We tend to turn what would bring us joy sometimes into limiting feelings of trappedness. And that's why I like to kind of shift and talk about this here. Coffee time for me is ritual. I really enjoy it. I love the smell of coffee. I love the, I love the routine of making coffee. It brings me brings me like a sense of security and anticipation. I love, I, I bought myself a new um, milk foamer and it like foams and warms up the milk and it really changed my routine into like a beautiful ritual where like I get all excited about how foamy my milk is and I get upset when it didn't foam very well. Messed up my whole joy time, right? <laughs> These are the things that can like throw us in, into that emotional resilience state. But my morning coffee routine is just so important. A new ritual that I've added into my life, my daily life that I really, really appreciate right now is um, Josh and I, um, we, we, he usually will get up and like go straight into phone, straight into emails, straight into taking a shower, straight in. And I really like, like you, Aunt Tina, were saying, I kind of like to wake up for a minute. I don't want to be thrown into the line of fire like right away. But I also, it's, it's a perfect time for me to just have a small connection time. Like just before we get busy today, just 
have a minute. And my partner has said, yeah, yeah, we can do that. So my morning ritual has been added into with this really beautiful, like, it can be five to seven minutes even. It's not that, it's not, it doesn't have to be that much time. But just that connection time with my partner has made me so much more joyful heading into my day. It's made such a big difference. So you can add little things like that that really make a big difference. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. In the evening, I um, absolutely love to just take a walk with the dog and with Rod. And um, we haven't been able to do it lately. And I really miss it. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's been like a week and a half. And you're right. It just, it's, it's the enjoyment of the moment mm -hmm. that you know, it gives you so much just peace and, and yes, everything is okay. And, you yeah. know, I get through tomorrow because I had this moment. When, yeah. when we don't prioritize rituals and moments of joy is when we lose hope. It's when we lose vision for why we're here it's it's where we lose the happiness of who we are and and so if you have that feeling of sadness or that that lack of hope it's typically because we've lost our vision and our prioritizing of celebrating life, right? right yeah yep and 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 this is the essence of life to me that if we if you're feeling pretty down in the dumps, I can usually usually correlate it to either you have a life situation that's taking up all the time, right? Like mom is in hospice or you have a job that's blowing up all around you. Like we have these moments where we're pulled, right? We're pulled away from joy. And sometimes we just have to deal with that. But how long can you sustain? How's your emotional resilience in that? And that's a really important question to ask. Right. Right. Yeah. How long can you go without doing those things that bring you that joy without finally just sinking into, you know, this, not. This not to even... me is the most critical thing you can do in, in relation to other people is to ask them. Like, what brings you joy? How can I help you feel joy? Because I think we don't realize how sad people are sometimes or how overwhelmed people are or, or you know, how much we need that sometimes, right? Right. People are really, really good at uh, just hiding it, too. I mean, you just, they don't let you know. They're smiling all the time. They're happy all the time. Believe we, me. we live in a society where we've been conditioned to be okay because to not be okay means you're weak you can't handle it i need to i need to i need to somehow diminish whatever's going on and the truth of it is no what i'm asking here is to say you know what i'm asking is to say you know can we identify what we need to feel joyful in our daily lives and then can we ask others to support us in that? Because this is the whole point of living on this planet is to feel the joy and the miracle of life that we're living. Like how crazy is it that we came from this stardust into this world and somehow we have consciousness, we have feelings, we have love and care and joy, like how cool, right? We forget that because we have we're, we are living in this like very structured, conditioned life where we've we've been told, you know, sometimes joy is not the top priority. Sometimes it's getting the job done. And the truth of it is, you can be really sad that your, you know, your mom is in hospice and the life changes are happening. You can be really sad about that and still give yourself spaces for joy so that emotional resilience. And that, that, that love of life doesn't get lost forever, doesn't get lost in the mix. When you think about how you connect to your mind, your body, and your spirit, how do you connect to your mind and body and spirit? The best way to get back in touch is, in, is using the five 
senses and grounding in nature. Those are the two easiest ways. And it only takes, it only takes three minutes to re-regulate your body to yourself in nature. Three minutes. That's all it takes. And within five minutes, you're actually changing your physiological operation within five minutes. So your heart rate changes, your blood pressure changes, your breathing changes in just five minutes. And the easiest way to do that is to engage your five senses, right? You're engaging sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch. There it is, right? And I don't mean you have to eat dirt. What I mean is you have to breathe in deeply through your mouth, right? 80% of our uh, taste comes from smell. So super easy. If there's anything that you leave here today with, it's to, to spend three to five minutes a day connecting outside in nature and using your five senses. It will change your heart rate. It changes your blood pressure, changes your breathing. It will re-regulate you into yourself so that you can re-regulate into the world. Well, this was you. a wonderful uh, presentation today. Christine, thank you. I'll, as always, we'll do more in the future for sure. And so anyway, I love all of you. Thank you so much.